this right here. Dr. Lee, who's a second year resident, he's gonna be talking about his work actually in single neuron correlates of declarative memory in the human right, you know, which is actually very, very um, in, uh, complex work, but I know I've seen his presentations. Uh, he distills it in a way that, that makes it understandable for all of us. If you look back, you see his elected, his education, BS at the University of California, San Diego. Then he went to UCLA for medical school. And obviously he's here with us as a resident. Some of his publications, a paper that recently came up based on the work that he did at UCLA. If we go to the next slide, you'll see the actual award that he was just given at the Young Investigator Award level for the American Epilepsy Society. And uh, we're very proud of the work he's doing. You know, he just last week, I think it was Thursday or Friday, he was a feature, if you want to learn a little bit more about him, he was a feature in the Voices of Mayo. He's been mentored, uh, mentored uh, very, very uh, uh, nicely by Dr. Sanjeev Grewal. Uh, and as we go to the next slide, go to the next slide. Sanjeev, do you want to say a few words? Thank you, Dr. Q. Uh, and, and, uh, and let's take, let's get rid of this slide. And as we let Dr. Lee, you know, put his slides and then Dr. Uh, Gree will say a few words. Go ahead, Sanjeev. Uh, I mean, James has been a rising star in, in epilepsy and functional neurosurgery as a resident. I'm really proud of his accomplishment, especially getting the Young Investigator Award. You know, they give that to 20 out of 13 or 1400 applicants. So he's been doing great work. Really looking forward to his talk today. Beautiful, thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Lee, take it away. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Right. So yeah, this is the some of the work that I've been doing uh, before uh, I've come to residency here at Mayo Clinic. So I'll go ahead and begin to save some time, but um, basically, you know, Forming and uh, recalling memories from the past is one of the most meaningful aspects of human experience, but how this works is still very elusive. So, for example, how do I remember giving this similar talk about two years ago as a sub intern here? And uh, how do I remember the night last year, you know, with these doctors here struggling to irrigate two bipolars at the same time? And uh, how can I forget, you know, countless times of my wife who indulges in her favorite hobby of sushi consumption? So this form of a uh, recollection of specific facts and events is defined as declarative memory. And some of our neurosurgical patients offer us a rare opportunity to study this human cognition at a single neuron level. So our lab has uh, previously described two independent populations of neurons in the human mesial temporal lobe, MTL, that are important subshifts for memory formation. Number one is visually selective neurons, which are neurons in the brain that encode specific visual categories. And uh, number two is uh, memory selective neurons that encode uh, familiarity and recognition. And I'll go over those in the next few slides. So most of our epilepsy patients uh, frequently report memory loss as one of the most prominent debilitating symptoms, and in particular recognition. And there's no gold standard test uh, that we can measure memory loss, but we also don't know how memory is affected, whether this memory deficit is due to neuronal dysfunction from a locally affected area or dysfunction across remote processes through network effects. So my project was to assess whether the tuning of these neurons that I described differ within the seizure onset zone and to correlate these neurons uh, at neuronal activity with memory past performance. So we included a total of 62 patients uh, with intractable epilepsy who underwent depth electrode implantation. This figure here shows uh, MNI electrode positions of all subjects. And these pink dots represent electrodes in the amygdala and the yellow represent the hippocampus. And below here is an example of uh, raw spikes reported from an electrode. And uh, all 62 patients performed a total of 92 sessions of the memory recognition task, yielding more than about 1,900 single neurons. So the memory recognition task consists of uh, two blocks, the learning block and the recognition block. And the learning block uh, displays a total of 100 images belonging to one of five categories, whether it was uh, animals, food, or people. And uh, after a delay period, the recognition block also displays a total of 100 images, but 50 of these images have been shown previously in the learning block. 
and the other 50 images were completely new to the patient. So after each trial, the subjects were asked to rate their confidence on whether the image was new or old on a, a scale of one to six, with six being, yes, I'm very confident that I saw this image before. So these are some of the sample raster plots of eight separate neurons. Uh, each dot here represents an action potential. And each of these rows represent a trial of the memory task. And at time points, as you can see, one and two represent the time window during which the image was shown. And you can see these top four uh, neurons here are examples of memory selective neurons. And these neurons are tuned to whether the image seen in the recognition block was new or familiar to the subject. So uh, for example, let's see, uh, example C here, this means that the neuron responded a lot higher with the strong memory tuning when they saw the image, when the given image was seen before in the learning block. So there's three examples of visually selective neurons here, E through G, and these are the neurons that can differentiate what kind of category of pictures you've seen. So for an example, if you see neuron F here, it responds whenever it's a category four, whether it's an animal or a person, uh, it responds a lot higher than the other categories. And finally, uh, I'd like to show you an example of a neuron that responds specific, specifically to uh, pictures of animals here. So the next question becomes then, you know, with these memory selective neurons that you see, do these tuning of memory uh, selective neurons differ within the seizure onset zone? And indeed, we show that the tuning strength as measured by omega uh, is significantly lower inside the seizure onset zone compared to the outside of the seizure onset zone. And this is also shown by a significant shift of distribution of the cumulative property of omega squared. Um, and not only did the tuning strength show deficits, but these uh, memory selective neurons were also not able to differentiate whether the subject had high confidence or low confidence in their answer. And as you can see, the figures below D and E are just some control analyses we did, we did to show that, you know, pyramidal cell loss in the hippocampus didn't really influence our results. And as another control, we show that the tuning of visually selective neurons were not affected by the presence of the seizure onset zone. And uh, interestingly, you know, those animal responsive neurons that I've shown did differ when they were located in the amygdala. And uh, this is pretty consistent with the numerous findings in literature that shows that the human amygdala is very special for some reason for processing visual, visual stimuli of non-human animals. And when we stratified the patients uh, based on the laterality of the seizure onset zone, uh, we found that the subjects with the right-sided uh, mesial temporal lobe seizure onset zone showed deficits with recollection during memory task. And this is defined by a Xerox slope. Um, this, is a, this is a way of differentiating whether the patient actually used a recollection during their memory task. We also uh, assessed their preoperative Weschler memory scale, which is like a, a, cycle, a psych psychology test that most of these patients get. Uh, and um, on the visual reproduction test here, you can see that their scores were a little lower when they were located on the right side. But of course, this test isn't perfect. And uh, we further demonstrate that these uh, right-sided seizure onset zone memory selective neurons show significant tuning deficits compared to the left side, whereas there's no laterality differences in the visually selective or animal responsive neurons. So in summary, we do show the first evidence of single neuron correlates of declarative memory strength tuning deficits in humans. And um, this was localized to the right MTL with decreased tuning strength of the memory retrieval confidence. Um, visual selectivity was not affected, which is consistent with the hypothesis that visual category differentiation may occur more upstream to the computational hierarchy. And um, animal responsiveness was, of course, of course uh, impaired within the amygdala seizure onset zone. This shows that the uh, memory deficits from epilepsy may be related to functional loss of specific neural types within uh, very localized circuits. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Rudishauser and the Rudishauser lab for teaching me all these complex analyses, how to code, very complex statistical uh, methods that we use, especially for um, uh, neural signal analyses. So thank you very much for listening to my talk.
Thank you, James. Um, Sanjit, are you there on the line still? Yeah, Dr. Q, I'm here. Great. Why don't you go ahead and uh, maybe uh, have a discussion with James? A lot of this stuff is quite complex, and it just went over my head, to be honest with you. And uh, maybe uh, maybe Dr. Nutmeyer can also help you, you know, if he understood or Dr. Dean. But I think a lot of the stuff just went over our heads. Why don't you help us put it in perspective for the rest of us? Yeah, James, uh, great talk. Uh, let's have the nerds unite and take over the world. Uh, but, you know, I, it'd be great if Dave, I don't know if Dave or, or Karen are, are on here, but James, what do you think is the significance of this uh, for us as surgeons treating epilepsy? And, and how do you think that is going to impact us moving forward? I have a few ideas, but I want to hear your thoughts first. Yeah, that's, that's a very common question that I've gotten. And uh, one of the questions you taught me how to answer when I was still alive. But um, I mean, these, we show that, you know, when you have a patient with epilepsy, we kind of think of like a disease zone as a zone where it's just a conglomerate of just nothingness and it's, everything's just destroyed. But what we show here is that it's just specific circuits and especially specific neurons that are dysfunctional, functional. So if we can somehow target these either genetically or um, some way to target them molecularly, I think there, there may be a way to preserve memory. And um, I think that's the most interesting aspect of it, not only the basic science of you know, local circuitry and computation of my work. I, I, you know, I, think, I think from looking at this at a, at a broader perspective, uh, and, and Dr. Q, you know this, you know, we take out right temporal lobes left and right and don't think twice about it. Uh, for the most part, we say, ah, people, people usually do quite fine. I think what this shows is that even as advanced as our neuropsych testing has gotten, I think we're missing a lot of things like declarative memory. Um, and I think we need to get finer instruments to understand quite the impact we're making on these changes with our resections. And, and this is where I think some of the work with awake surgery can be helpful, where we can, we can have tests looking specifically at these while we're doing our sections. Yeah, I, don't know I, your thoughts I also are. agree with that. Um, there's also, I think there was an interesting discussion previously with you, uh, especially uh, when we take out brain tumors in some of our patients, we don't really take into account, you know, let's say somebody has a job in accounting and the calculation is very important for them. Like, do we really know calculations, uh, like numerical calculations are being computed in the brain? And that would be one interesting aspect to look at. Um, I like that discussion, James, and, um, and Dr. Grewal, Sanjit. So I guess in how, why would someone in spine right now, we have a lot of spine colleagues right now, you know, and I think that I heard that they should care about this because for them or for any of us who one day want to be able to remember what rod to use in a certain construct or, you know, what screws, what measures and stuff like that, we don't really understand how the non-dominant hemisphere may play a role in those critical functions. We assume, you know, as Sanjit said, that we can take out with, uh, with very little reservations, four to five centimeters of the temporal love in the non-dominant hemisphere because that's how we learn but the reality is there's a lot more there that meets the eye and through this work that you did we began to understand that indeed there's eloquence there that is very very important because that's what i gathered from you dr yeah. q if yes. i could just take a yes. moment this is karen Please. blackman and oh beautiful doctor and dr lee i have to say this is just such really exciting inspiring work um it's great to see those slides and the work you're doing and i just want to add you know we we often get confused because we we do take out the right hippocampal mesial temporal area all the time and patients seem to do fine with memory and the way i understand your work and i think the implications are that you know, and if you if you turn to some of the literature on pattern separation, that some of these hippocampal neurons are engaged in that early work of learning and separating very similar, let's say, words or objects or um, any kind of stimuli that looks similar, but we need some way for the brain to differentiate it. So when we initially learn something, the hippocampus is involved in setting up um, these long-term loops for consolidating new material. And that, so there's neurons in the hippocampus that can be very selective in that early learning stage. And that later on, 
they may um, take on a different role with new stimuli. They may not be always, this is, this is controversial, but that they are very important for that initial learning and play a role. But for con consolidation to take place, they have to keep that uh, rhythm going over time, maybe even over years. And that over, you know, eventually they become, um, you know, superfluous. We don't need them anymore. The memory is more cortically based, but in that early learning and consolidation phase, they're so critical. So I think what you're showing is, I, I call this when I teach memory, it's like the conductor of the memory symphony that goes on for many years. And he's trying to, you know, get all these different neurons in the cortex to play together. And the right hippocampus is probably important for that. But over time, that conductor becomes useless because the symphony can play on its own. But if it's drunk at the podium and some places are just playing off key, then um, the memory just isn't encoded as efficiently. So I think of these single neuron selectivity as kind of the drunk conductor that everything's off key and everything's playing wrong. And so the memories just aren't encoded as efficiently. But if we take it out, the interesting thing about the right hippocampus is there does seem to be some plasticity in other areas that do take over. So maybe for a period of time, the, you know, the memory symphony is a little off for that patient, but over they can eventually start to form new symphonies that play in tune again. Um, the left hippocampus, for some reason, is a much more critical conductor, and we don't know why yet. And of course, there's the verbal and nonverbal distinction there, but it seems to be a much more important um, you know, when we take it out, the, the symphony doesn't seem to do as well for much longer. And if they're younger, maybe they can train a new conductor, but we don't know. Um, so there's some confusion distinctions there. So that's why I understand this work, that it shows some of the relevance, again, of the pattern separation in the hippocampus and that early learning, but that we can't forget there's a lot of plasticity. So for the surgeons involved to um, not then say, oh, we can't take this out because there's single neuron selectivity, but um, you know, more fascinating question is how is there represent representational drift? How do other areas take over? And that seems to be more the norm for the right hippocampus. So sorry for talking a bit, but. Beautiful, thank you. Well, when you start talking about the symphony, the first person that raised a hand was Dr. Chen, who is also one of our spine surgeons. See, this is what I wanted to see if I can get the spine surgeons engaged in this. Go ahead, Selby, take it away. Oh, uh, thank you very much uh, for that talk, James. Um, so, you know, question for you and also, I guess, the neurologists in the group. Um, have there been any formal uh, neuropsychiatric testing looking specifically at either formation of declarative memory or recall of declarative memory in patients who have either had strokes to the medial right temporal lobe or surgery to the medial right temporal lobe? Yeah, I think most of the earlier works, uh, especially with the uh, declarative memory deficits, has been done with stroke or brain tumor patients who have them, who have those uh, lesions resected and they do, the, uh, they go undergo a series of tests, whether it's the Western memory scale or, uh, you know, customized memory uh, tests that specifically test declarative memory and um, especially uh, recognition memory, which is kind of like a specific subset of declarative memory. But yeah, most of those studies have been done by lesional studies in the past. And have they demonstrated any specific uh, deficits, whether in formation or recall? Yeah, it's it's mostly, um, they, they've mostly displayed deficits, but they don't really follow it, follow it up long term. And the issue is that all of these tests that they use are not standardized. And um, it's really difficult to really extrapolate what it really means. And I think that's what's very interesting about, you know, studying memory. Um, even these gold standard tests that we, or even these uh, tests that we use are not gold standard. And um, it, there needs to be also better tests that detect or quantify, you know, memory recall, whether it's like short-term or long-term. So, yeah. Great, right, thank you. So I, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chen. I was actually, I don't know if people realize that your very first paper that you published in PNAS with Dr. Travis out of Harvard, you know, really had to do with uh, plasticity, with brain, with, uh, recordings of neurons and stuff like that. And I was trying to pull it out as you were talking, I was gonna put it in the <laughs> chat. But for some reason, when I put your last name in Dr. Kravitz, it crashed my computer. So, but I'll pull it out and I'll, I'll show it because I know you're a spine surgeon, but inside there's a brain surgeon inside of you. So let's see, let's see, Dr. Miller, go ahead, Dr. Miller. Yeah, no, extremely interesting work. I agree with what's been said, I guess my, my question is, the, uh, has there been, I mean, obviously this opens uh, uh, the door to rehab. Uh, what's, the, what's the potential there? Has there been work done with 
with repetitively stimulating some of these areas to see if you can. So I look at my stroke patients. I look at them, they have deficits. They get better for a year or so they get kind of stuck and they get where they're gonna get. And they, a lot of them have minor, but relative, very frustrating difficulties with memory, short-term memory processing and stuff. Is there a way now, if, if you're identifying where these areas are, is there a way to, or has anyone looked at, and I'm sure some people have thought about it obviously, but has anybody done some stimulation of these areas? As Dr. Blackman referred to, is, is, is this is an area when, of early development and imprinting, is this a way back in? Is this a way that we can stimulate the brain to sort of start to process all over again as if you were a child, start to put those memory, yeah. uh, those memory connections back? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a really great question. I know um, UCLA did publish a, a year ago, I think, um, where they do write, where they actually did a right mesotemporal lobe stimulation. And this, this did seem to improve a visual, visual memory in, in some aspect. But how much of that really helps patients, we're not really sure. And the um, thing about these stimulation studies, too, is, um, you know, we're just sticking in electrodes, hoping that these some sort of like these pulses help the patients. But really, what what is it really doing? It's not. I, I shouldn't say this, but it's not particularly uh, eloquent in terms of a. Uh, uh, but I mean, if it helps patients, it helps patients. But what kind of quality of life do they have after implantations of these right uh, MTL? You know, we never know. Um, there's also uh, multiple years back by Itzhak Fried. I think uh, there was a New England Journal paper where he stimulated the entorhinal cortex and um, the patients were able to do some visual or I think it was like navigating tasks a little better than the others, but it, it's still a very preliminary, um, uh, still the waiting to see uh, how yeah, it- Preliminary, out. yes, but, but you know, as I said, extremely exciting. If you, if you have identifying the pathway and you know that uh, at one time it, it helps uh, develop and uh, a memory base. It seems that, that that maybe we have a way. Yes, maybe it's a time thing, and maybe it goes away. But maybe if the cells are there dormant, if there's a way to re to re-energize the pathway, it would be a fantastic path. You know, with fantastic method to try and, and get some of our stroke patients a, a yeah. lot better functional outcome. I agree, Dr. Miller. I think it would be very interesting to see, like, to follow up with all of our stroke patients and see what kind of deficits they have. You know. I already have all of these like memory tests coded and it's in my computer. It's just as simple, it's just as simple as running them like when they do visit. Oh, we should, we yeah. should definitely, oh, yeah. start, we, should def we should definitely look at that with respect to our stroke patients. We need to talk. Okay. I'm gonna to go to Dr. Tatum, but before I wanna make two comments, first of all, I wanna make sure that Dr. Blogman, you know, I saw a comment right there by Stacy, who is one of her leads. And she was so grateful that you provided that analogy for people to make sense of what we are listening or we're seeing right now. You know, sometimes you can get complicated. The second one is that paper in PNAS. And I saw the comment by Selby right now. That was a, that is, I don't know if people realize so 375 citations of that paper alone. But what it did is another 23 years of NI, 25 total NIH funding because that led to a, an NIH grant by Dr. Kravitz. I just had a meeting with Dr. Kravitz on Sunday night. You know, he was a, a mentor for Selby, for myself. Selby was an undergraduate and I was obviously in medical school. And he is um, the most senior person still funded by the NIH actually. And um, he and I had a FaceTime. He learned how to use FaceTime. We were conferencing yesterday, it was amazing. And that's how many years. So this was the first paper right there. But it also has to do with aggression, it has to do with recording, it has to do with plasticity in the brain. So somehow related to a lot of this work. So I pivot now to Dr. Tatum, who does a lot of epilepsy work. Go ahead, Dr. Tatum, take it away. Thanks, Dr. Q. I just wanted to weigh in relative to what Karen had to say about the uh, orchestra and kind of relate that to what the UCLA group had found with uh, uh, stimulation within the language area with their single cell recording of which, uh, uh, James, you did a great job and you come from a great, great background with Dr. Freed. But what they found is that uh, different populations through microwire recording placed by depth electrodes into the hippocampus showed differences relative to activation, deactivation, or no response at all, even within that micro environment that was closely associated within the hippocampus. And so I, I'm curious, I read your paper in Epilepsia. Uh, did, you, did you find different populations and pools 
in the right hippocampus that did the same thing? Uh, so in terms of like what kind of neuronal cell types there are, I think the only thing yeah. we, uh -huh. Well, just in terms of uh, uh, either increase in uh, burst firing or decrease in firing. Oh yeah, the, oh, the environment, I see. Yeah, I did, oh yeah, that was a kind of a painful portion of my project, but I did look at uh, IEDs through microelectrodes. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's really different from uh, calculating or detecting IEDs or, you know, HFOs through like, you know, the macroelectrodes that, that we have, but microelectrodes are a different beast. And well, I do know how to do it, um, but we didn't find any differences on the rate of HFOs or IE, uh, IEDs versus the memory task. But um, I, 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 I think there's a, a, there should be something there. It's just a matter of like thinking through it and um, really, uh, trying to analyze which portion of the memory test that I want to look at, but it, it, so, it's like so, a whole couple of years. Of, yeah. So, so, so just food for thought. Uh, there is a proprietary uh, depth electrode that does have several microwires that extend from the tip of that electrode that is commercially available um, that was developed uh, in UCLA, at UCLA actually. And Sanjeet and I have spoken about using these maybe now with your expertise uh, that might be something that we could take a look at to separate left from right relative to the orchestra and maybe MTS from glioma, which has post-operative neuropsych ramifications on memory to see if there's not a conductor difference. Yeah, that, that really sounds like a great idea. I'm always ready, Dr. Tatum, so. <laughs> <laughs> great job, I'm James. Ready. Thank you. Dr. Tatum, thank you. The biggest, challenge, <laughs> the biggest challenge that I'd like to put in front of you is how would you be able to convince someone like Selby to put some of this on the spine or something like that? You know what I mean? For some sort of recording of some form or another, you know, but I, it, integrating some of these technologies is always... They challenge, but that's amazing work, you know, really. I think and I see yeah. Dr. Nat Meyer, who's there with you? Someone is talking to you. Is, is that one of our colleagues there? Is he paying attention to your talk? <laughs> oh, he's, he's talking to someone. Yeah. I thought that there was someone right there also. But yeah. beautiful work. Thank you for all the comments. Great. Well, listen, what a great way to start the week. Thanks, everybody, for being here this morning with all of us. Thank you, James, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, this is really led by Selby and Kai, who are having our residents present their work um, and that they, they do. And they do this amazing talks. And the idea is to create more collaborative efforts and to uh, have everybody work with each other and learn from each other. So we're very grateful for that. So uh, and thanks everybody for coming. Many countries, many people, invited guests, you know, from around the world. We thank you immensely. We'll see you on Friday. If you have an opportunity to attend our multidisciplinary conference, please do so and have a great, great week, all right? Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Gracias. Bye-bye. Gracias.